Good evening. This is Rodney Ham or Rebel Rod on Facebook uh, trying to recruit for the Democratic Party. I want to let you know that there's a book, it's a great read by Robert Meacham called An American Lion and it pertains to Rebel Rod because it's the description of a presidency and some would say a tyrant but he was much needed at the time and as he made his way in this world he started out being born in the Revolutionary War an atrocious war of belief systems between the Irish and the English that still lingers to this day. He watched his mother pass, he never knew his father, and at a very early adolescent age of maybe 11 or 12, began to follow the soldiers as they made their way from South Carolina and ran into my great, 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 great aunt. Rachel Donaldson and her family who are significant throughout Tennessee as you can see from my broadcast on YouTube. President Jackson fell in love with Rachel amidst his efforts in the ending of the War of 1812 where he was asked to come and help serve in the battle against the English, whom he hated so. So as he traveled down, he started to collect soldiers, volunteers from Tennessee. As he did, they would recruit other soldiers. And the troops that were waiting in Shreveport expected him to show up with less than 300 soldiers as he came in with over 3,000. Most of them were lost in the battles, but he drew out the line right there where the Louisiana Purchase in of the South of America and he did it with bayonets and cannons and horses and swords. And as he made his way through the battle, at the end, the English fought the naval vessels out in the Gulf of Mexico. And it seemed like impending doom when the reinforcements would be there, since they were battered, scarred, and very few remained. But in his genius, he decided that they probably didn't know how many were there. So he decided to intimidate them at night by rolling cannons up and firing them, knowing that he couldn't hit the boats, but that they would see the fire coming from the new America. As they did, they began to take their boats elsewhere and he finally went home and settled down with Rachel and started his family, started the Hermitage in Tennessee, which is a great historical asset to this country, needs to be supported. And he got a call of duty from President Monroe, who said that there was a lot of defectives there was a lot of issues with the Seminoles in Florida. They had Spanish uh, occupiers. They had the battleships that could have been from the melee in the Gulf of Mexico, selling guns, arming uh, the people who were not going to be a part of the United States of America or the South. So he got on his horse 
and began his journey teaching and recruiting soldiers in this makeshift militia of his. When he got down to the Georgia-Florida line, three of them decided they were going back home. And he told them, you're not going to defect from my army. Establishing himself as the general, the one who gave the orders. They tested him, and he shot and killed him. I don't know of any other soldiers who decided to go against President Andrew Jackson, future President Andrew Jackson, throughout the rest of his campaign. When he got down to the peninsula and Florida, somewhere right in the beginning, it might have been Fort Negro, he found some Englishmen that were down there selling guns and ammunition to the Indians and others. And he arrested them and took them to uh, the courts and took off to finish his war against these defectors. And as he did, someone came on horseback and told him they found the three Englishmen guilty and hung them. But they were waiting for the trial for the king's right-hand man, who was their captain, because President Monroe sent word to just send him back to England. And old Hickory said, we're going to stop what we're doing, and I'm going to go back and check. And on horseback, he went back and sat in the courts as the judge dismissed the charges because of his high stature with the king and fear that the English would declare war and come in droves with their navy once again. Andrew Jackson said, I can't allow this to happen because he had a new vision of what he was going to do in Florida and he couldn't have anyone taking an easy road out because it was his roads that were going to carve out Florida and bring it into the United States. So he told the judge stand down and he walked the man out and he shot him. He went through Florida instilling fear, winning wars and battles and once stopped somewhere in central Florida as one of the great Indian leaders the tribe was almost driven to extinction. The chief came to the fort where he was staying and walked down the middle of the road in full war paint and Indian headdress, bringing some of the soldiers to tears. And these are the atrocities of war. The Indian came and looked at General Jackson and he said, We surrender. And Jackson said, you showed great courage and great valor as a leader of your people. So I'll spare your life. And he let him go after he signed the treaty. He went on down into South Florida and began to build his own navy so that he could hunt for other defectors throughout the Keys, possibly even Cuba, when President Monroe asked him to come back. He came back to find Rachel at the Hermitage and a request 
to represent Florida and Tennessee and the rest of the South and become the president. He was elated. But a politician, he was not. He was learning. And his counterpart began a slanderous campaign against my great 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 aunt. She fell into a state of depression and her health became questioned, as well as her integrity. She knew she couldn't make it. She knew she couldn't deal with all the things that were going to happen once old Hickory got to Washington. She asked her adopted son and adopted daughter, Andrew Jackson Donaldson, and Emily Donaldson, if they would support who they were now calling King Andrew. They agreed and followed him to Washington after her death. They said it took almost all the vigor out of President Jackson, but he found enough belief in America to make that journey and to sit in the White House as president and teach not only Emily and Andrew Jr., but others that America was changing. <clears throat> you could change with it or you could fall to it. Most changed with it. Unfortunately, there were campaigns by militia, soldiers, farmers, and others to eradicate the American Indian. Not all of them, but most of them, because they would not join the United States. They wanted to remain Indian. They wanted to continue their belief system and continue to what they called graze or settle down in territories that were now being populated by the English and Irish. It was complicated, I'm sure. And Andrew Jackson sat down with the sitting Congress Senate and other leaders and decided that in the best interest of preserving uh, the Native American, the American Indian, the best thing to do would be to reallocate them to Oklahoma and other western states so that they could be who they were and have their own land. But as we well know, most of them did not make it. And that was the Indian Removal Act that was so controversial that defined an American lion. But if you take a look at what he did for America, someone had to cross the bridge from the old to the new. And what Andrew Jackson did was set fire to the English and free fort, fell in love, and then finished the campaign on horseback with this Tennessee militia that completely carved out the rest of the South, even if it was on respect alone. He incepted all the states of the South and even was alive when Andrew Jackson Jr., Andrew Jackson Donaldson, was sent by Sam Houston to Texas to try to create legislation to finally seal off from Mexico the rest of the West in the United States. He was significant in American history 
And I believe that Donald J. Trump has great respect for certain aspects of Andrew Jackson. But I think that Andrew Jackson would be quite appalled to have seen children cry, to have seen fear throughout the United States, to see the chaos that ensued as the more ignorant Trump voters failed to realize that we have a foundation in this country called a Constitution, called a Bill of Rights, and one of the focal points in all of this is due process. When you lose, you shake the man or woman's hand that beat you, and you congratulate them, and you leave, and you remember, and you learn, and you grow. And you build a plan for the future so that you're not beat again. And that's what this country has to do. Because we were beat. We were beat because we voted for a man who was a real estate investor. Whose dad stopped funding him when he was in college because of his narcissism. Who had a failed adventure because he wanted to be Mr. Las Vegas and signed boxing deals at the Mirage as Atlantic City was built on credit. He's a man who hasn't participated in paying taxes uh, much more than a regular worker in a factory, yet claims to have all the money in the world, and it's all tied up in these banks who own him. He said he was going to pay for his own campaign contributions, wouldn't be needed, and sold off all his businesses or traded them to Donald J. Trump Jr. <clears throat> One thing that I remember specifically was the outlandish comments he made about an American hero from Arizona named John McCain. It sickened my stomach to see a reality TV star stick his nose in the political arena and destroy a good Republican, a man of great service, a man of great valor, and an American soldier. He then turned and started to set his sights on making people giggle as he attacked the Bushes as a family, a family that has been involved in American politics, in the growth of America. They've been involved in the atrocities that have happened like September 11th, and all we could do as Republicans is support a man who belittled them. Then we have to reflect upon the Miss Universe pageants where beautiful young ladies were adorned and the world would watch, and he made comments like that he would grab them we watched his divorce fall apart from Marla Maples and got to see the misogynism, the failure to produce his tax documents, and his complete dismissal of someone that he loved. Then he turns around, calls Vice President Pence, who actually helped him get quite a bit of the vote to begin with. <clears throat> and told him to stand down on the day that the takeover happened in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol. To me, when he did that, and when Vice President Pence admitted it on CNN in the interview, he claimed to be the leader because he was directing the traffic by telling the Vice President, much like Adolf Hitler told the Chancellor in Germany with the SS to stand down. Fortunately, Pence did not. If we go back to Germany and we look at what happened, after the Chancellor stood down for Adolf Hitler and the SS, they turned their sights on the German military, the Nazis. 
and the Nazis had no choice. They were outnumbered and outgunned. Which brings us to gun laws and how we need to address them. We should never allow people like the Trump supporters to have fully automatic weapons. I would consider them to be weapons of mass destruction. And we see it over and over again with these hillbillies and these mentally ill people walking in and shooting our children. They've walked into churches and shot all the prisoners. And usually you'll find three things. You'll find a person who has a shattered ego, probably because of bullying. You'll find a person who has hate in their heart associated with racism. And you'll always find that the gun is borrowed or stolen. Very seldom do they follow the laws, which brings us to a complex issue. If we outlaw guns, then only outlaws will carry guns. So you have to decide what war you're in. Are you the outlaws? Or are you the legal police officers who protect this nation? Because there is a war going on. And unfortunately, we have to choose sides. I look at Cleveland, Ohio, where a young man was playing in the playground who was shot and killed. It's sad. It really is. And the media wants us to look at it. It's just a casualty of war. If we take a look at Trayvon Martin, there was no reason for this. It wasn't even a police officer that shot him. They described the police officer community because it always gets brought up by people who don't really do research. Half of America probably thinks he was a police officer. What do you do? Well, take a look at what they did. They said it was a stand-your-ground law so, don't walk with Skittles in your pocket through apartment complexes with paranoid and delusional people. My point, there are no answers. But somehow, our country, in its ingenuity, always seems to find one and flourish. And that's what we do as Democrats in Ohio. 